Get the most healthy people at first. So are we ready? Yep. Great. All right. So um, my name is Linda D. I'm from Eighth Action Baltimore and the um, co-chair of the uh, Dare Cap with Danielle Campbell, who's also my co-chair. Now the name on this slide is Boris Joel because these are Boris's slides. Now I put a little color in them because they were all dull, um, and uh, I really pared them down because we don't have a lot of time. So we had a meeting, a consensus meeting, to try and figure out what's the best way to do these ATIs, what's the best way to decide when we need them, what's the best way to decide what's safest, and to maximize the data that we get from them. But mostly, as far as the community is concerned, um, what's the safest way to deal with them? So Boris's name is on them, not mine, because they're really his. Um, we had this consensus meeting in Boston in July. It was really well attended. It took quite a few months this community summary side, you can look at it while we're talking, to get it together, but we had a really broad uh, array of stakeholders, and um, you know, we, as I said, we've been doing a lot of advocacy leading up to this point, so we were really fierce that day and have been proud of us. So the reason that we need ATIs is it's not, you know, it's, uh, late reservoirs, which is the, the reason that we can't cure it, HIV, these, these bloody little things that just come up and go away and come up and stay up and they just are not, our, our antiviral armamentarium is not effective against them. So, what we need to do is measure this, these latent reservoirs, just like we, you get your viral load measure. And if you didn't have viral load tests to measure your, your virus, you wouldn't know if your antiviral medication was working. So we don't know, and we don't know yet if these interventions will be working because we have nothing to measure them with. Plus, I'm telling you in the future, when you when I'll talk about immunology trials later, but maybe I'll, I'll save that for later because we're in a bit of a hurry. So the purpose of this meeting was to try to come up with a set of recommendations that most people could live with that again maximizes our knowledge and minimizes the risk to um, to participants. We did uh, we did have a lot of consensus on um, uh, lack of alternatives, on no one size fits all, on different risk mitigation strategies, including the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, really, we were all over the place with the restart criteria and um, really all over the place with uh, PrEP and whether, how, whether, and, and the methods, best methods to give uh, PrEP to partners and participants so that they don't become infected um, during this period. Now, this 23 number, it might be a little wrong. Richard gave us that, but this was back in July, so I'm sure there are probably a few more studies that include analytic treatment interruptions. Um, and again, the problem was that these studies were all over the place. So some have a very different criteria. There were no standards, so uh, we really wanted to try and uh, bring people together, get recommendations together, and, uh, and do our best to um, uh, you know, minimize the risk for patients. Here are the workshop participants. The um, meeting, uh, whatever, what we call, I forget what we were called. The people that got the meeting together are in pink. Um, so again, that what we're going to go over here today are benefits and risks, risk mitigation as far as the eligibility criteria and as far as the uh, uh, restart of, of, um, of uh, uh, antivirals once uh, the viral load rebounds. And each we had a moderated session. Uh, a number of moderated sessions, and the ethics, I'm sorry, a moderated session for each of these. We actually voted at the end, so I'll show you what the out people voted and the results of that. So, uh, let me see, uh, I think I'm going to be running out of time. So, no robust markers, you know, uh, we decided that the onus is going to be on the investigators not to use these ATIs for every single trial, but only when we were looking for some sort of an immunologic uh, a reaction so that um, you didn't unnecessarily subject people to the risk of being going off therapy. And that they need to come up with a justification for these things before you made a go no go decision, including including uh, doing animal data to make sure whatever the intervention you were using is safe. So there are two kinds of ATIs. One is not so not so risky to miniature viral load rebounds, you get back on the therapy. So that's kind of easy, all right? The, the more difficult and the more risky and controversial ATI are the um, set point um, uh, ATIs, where they're, what they're trying to do is stop your therapy, give you interventions, maybe your viral load will come up a little bit, and the interventions will hopefully um, make you be able to fight the, a virus with your own body. So they're gonna have to have the virus come up 
to see if your own body can make it come down. So that means that you're going to be off therapy longer, um, and you know uh, the, the concern for the investigators is that what they're trying to do is make you what's called post-treatment controllers. After you finish with this trial and this intervention, your own body again will be able to combat the, the virus, and maybe with periodic uh, treatments. You know, we don't know any of that yet. That's really not the point of this talk. But anyhow. In order to make these post-treatment controllers, you really are going to have to um, give the intervention a little bit of time and watch to see if the virus goes up and then comes down. So the, the, the trick and what nobody could agree to was what the stopping point should be before we restart. The stopping before we restart, and you know what I mean, right? So some of the potential risks for ATIs are acute retroviral syndrome, syndrome. You know how sick people get when we first become infected, uh, increases in the size of the viral reservoir and, vi and viral diversity. A lot of the docs are saying now that um, um, people who, the, the reservoir size has not been that, that, that uh, increased that much, but I think it's early days. So, you know, they all say that their trials are working fine with no problem. Anyway, um, we have resistance issues. So if you're off drugs, then does resistance happen? Are you going to be, have have um, you know drugs to take when this is all over with? So um, uh, there's some criteria later on that I'll get to that that addresses that. And suppose you have a neurologic cardiovascular cancer, liver, or renal disease, kidney disease. Um, you know, inflammation is a big problem when you come off of your drugs. So I'm glad people are shaking their heads so I know that I'm not going too too fast. Uh, and of course, the, the, uh, the really big bugaboo and the big black hole is transmission during viral rebound. So here was the first thing that we voted on. Um, so the FDA considers people with HIV that are not sick to be healthy volunteers. So that means you have to have a risk benefit. You know, you can't start giving them poison if they can take one pill a day and be fine. So. Um, uh, that's, I think, the best rationale for looking at healthy volunteers first in these uh, relatively healthy people in these first trials and not having the consideration be, well, we just need to enroll the trials and we can enroll more people with, you know, 350 CD4s rather than, than uh, 500. This was the biggest battle we had that we actually won. And, um, I mean, I, I, again, because the researchers, if they want the criteria to be anybody with 350 or above, can be involved in these trials, and we really were very much against that, argued for 500, and we got our way. So how many was at that meeting raise your hand? So it was a number of us there. It was more of us that are here today, but you know, we fought the good fight, and we really, uh, that was the thing that I'm the most proud of. Um, so. Can you repeat that? I'm not sure. Okay, so in other words, the investigators, most of the investigators, want the criteria to be that you have to have at least 350 CD4s to get in these in these ATI trials. All right, the community and other researchers, not just you know, not all researchers think the same. Obviously, they wanted we wanted it to be the criteria to start with 500 CD4s, and unless you have a CD4 count of 500, you're not eligible to enter these trials. Because remember, your CD4s are going to go down, your viral load is going to go up. So if it starts at 350, you know, it's too much, too close to a danger zone for, for my liking anyway. So um, it was close, but we won this argument, which I think is probably one of the most important. Yeah, we deserve a clap for that, believe me. <laughs> that was me, but it was really, we had a hard fight on that. Richard was very helpful with that too, looking at all the different studies and bringing a lot of info. To, uh, to the meeting as we went. Yeah? Was there any talk about CD4 Nader? Next. Uh, it's, it's coming up, I promise. <laughs> so um, so um, then we talked about strict inclusion criteria. The Nader's up there. There's another slide just on Nader. Um, so they decided on 200. We've tried to get 350, but I don't know. This is a much more, I'm not absolutely convinced that this is as important as the, um, the C4, but nobody knows. I would like to have it to have been 350, and I think that we'll still argue for that, but um, um, that's a big jury, hung jury kind of question at this point. So history of AIDS defining illnesses. You can see, do I have a pointer? You can see 
Um, the yes, no, and what got the most votes. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, cancer in the last 10 years, drug resistance to, it's like my little cat pointer. Um, oh my God, I forgot to leave it out for the cat. Oh well. Um, yeah, so anyway, we talked about resistance. So a person not, would have to have um, activity, or two other classes of drugs would need to be active or else they wouldn't be able to be enrolled in this study. So they have an option if they become resistant to the medication they started with. So we did, we did fairly well with all those. Um, coronary artery disease, again, because of the inflammation aspect of this, uh, kidney disease, and um, you know, this one as well, this um, partner, uh, there's, well, there, I'm, I'm not gonna go into that a whole lot, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna run out of time and it's discussed more later. But if a, if a participant proves that he can't, um, uh, that he's getting um, STIs and different things, and the idea that he might infect somebody, uh, and at the discretion of the uh, investigator, should he be in or out. So that was still no, you know? Not using or able to use PrEP. We'll discuss that a bit later, because that's a huge, huge issue. So, what is this one? Um, yeah, was that enough of a nader response? Like, you have, you know, does that answer your question about the nader? Yeah, it doesn't make me happy. Yeah, me neither, <laughs> but, you know, so. So, so Yeah. What, what um, reason did the FDA give for saying that, that 200 would be safe? We it wasn't the FDA. It, was, it really was the researchers. You know, that um, they, they're doing all these studies. It doesn't make any difference. Um, you know, that it, it really has no effect on the overall outcomes. And, and to us, it's more like, well, somebody, 15 minutes, I really better get started. Uh, can we talk about this later? Because I got a lot more to go. <laughs> the thing is, we got more work to do. Yeah. So I don't agree with you. I don't either. I don't either. But that's the one, that's, I think, probably the biggest one we lost. So no clap for that. Clap again to give us some energy to keep fighting, huh? <laughs> so anyway, then we talked about monitoring um, and how often we drag people in to be tested. So the, the consensus was once a week for the first 12 weeks and every other week thereafter to be, to do actually get a stick, to get a blood draw to see if you have a rebound. And then we also talked about home testing considerations that might be appropriate for some people. We're not there yet either. So the restart criteria was all over the place. Um, we talked about, um, uh, it, well, I suppose the CD4s go down to 316. Suppose the percentage goes down to 15%. Or if somebody had 1,000 CD4s and they had a 30% de decline, if there was evidence of unprotected sex, um, should we restart this person? And I think most people thought that was the case, but we're gonna see some, some voting on all of these things. Okay, so here's where they ended up, which was really a surprise to me. Um, instead of, the, they, were, they were more safe here than anywhere. You know, if you have a viral load of 1,000 for uh, four weeks or greater, you need to get restarted. So anybody that wants to make you a post-treatment controller and try to see how your, if we can let you make your viral load to go down on its own after the intervention, they wanted this. You know, and I kept saying, well, why 50,000? Why can't we try 35 at first and try it for a week or two or whatever? But, you know, and be hardheads. So we didn't get any, nobody won this one, I think, except maybe the patients. <laughs> All right. So, and so the ethics. Well, we're doing pretty good. We don't have a whole lot of slides left. <coughs> um, we talked about the, the um, uh, problem of the word cure, using cure on the trials, on the informed consent forms. You know, it reminds me of phase one trials. Why do people get in these trials, you know? Mostly because they're good and altruistic and wonderful people that are willing to help. But we just want to be sure that they have a reasonable expectation of what's going to happen and that they know there's going to be no benefit for them. So we thought the best way to do that is not stamp cure all over everything. You know, I mean, people have a tendency, you see that, and that's all you see, some people anyway. So we came up with a number of different um, terms. I don't know that any of them are, are, are you know, perfect, but this is what they were. Drug-free, long-term control, undetectable, off-treatment, viral suppression, off-treatment, art-free, viral 
remission and then just remission. I think remission is probably not really the most popular from the potential participants that we spoke to. They, uh, it sounds like cancer, it sounds like you're still sick. You know, how many people, how many people don't like the term transmission, I mean remission in this? So it's, you know, how many don't care about it and that, that it seems okay to them? So it's about the same. Anyway, I, I think we'll probably try and stay away from that. Okay, and the other question is there a scientific, the other ethical, big ethical issue is there a scientific um, justification for placebo control? So the big deal with that is, is you know, some of these things are for first in humans that we're not, we don't know if they're going to work, we want to be sure, we're doing evidence-based research. You know, placebo is a red flag for many of us, but then Tony Fauci from NIAID had showed that the results of this vaccine trial and had there not been a placebo control, you, the, it would have looked like the you know, the vaccine worked when it really did. So then there's an argument that it's unethical not to use a placebo if you get wrong results. So I think people are coming around to understanding that. Maybe not liking it, but I think it, you know, until we know more about these drugs, uh, placebos might be indicated in some trials at least. The really good news, and I know Kareem is very happy about this, that they voted over, oh no, this is the wrong one. Okay. Now this is the after one after this, the last slide. Here comes the PrEP trial. Well, Christ, I mean, if you ask a community person, should you offer a PrEP? Everybody says yes, offer a PrEP. You know, do as much as we can to help the participants. There were some investigators, now not in the room that day, but I mean, it was like, I thought there was gonna be a food fight with a couple of them. I wanted to say who or where they're from, but they were unhappy. This is not our responsibility. This is the patient's responsibility. We're good. So anyway, I think, this is going to be future advocacy for us. Um, you know, I was talking to one of the MDC cabs the other day, and and they, there was somebody there from Thailand, and he, you know, we said, well, how did we, you know, we asked him how do you do in Thailand, and really in Thailand, they're so wonderful there. Uh, we we have our prep shop right next door, so it's very easy to do a warm transfer to another department. And our joints have a tendency to be huge you know, university-based institutions that may be perhaps on site, maybe it ain't, you know, so it's, it's probably a little bit more complicated. So I think it's painfully obvious that what might work for Baltimore or Washington or Pittsburgh or anywhere else might be different. But I think at, at the, the bare minimum at this point is that we have to insist that um, investigators at least give the partners uh, a, uh, you know, like a sheet of, the, of facts about how they can become infected, where they can go for testing, treatment, and prep access, phone numbers, you know, um, and all of that sort of thing. So I think our role or our job is going to probably be how to make how to push that envelope to make that even prep even more accessible. And I think we're going to have to do it at individual sites because they're going to all be so different as to where prep is available and that sort of thing. So and this is the one for you, Corinne. Um, they vote, people voted, um, you can see overwhelmingly that social science, behavioral ethics questions, and you know, studies, surveys should be included in these trials. So you know how well the CDC, I can't believe I'm giving them a compliment, but they've done pretty well at looking at behavioral uh, research in PrEP trials. So we need the same thing for these API trials to figure out what's what and how people feel about this stuff. So yay for Boris. <laughs> And I guess we still have a couple minutes for questions. Linda, were yes. you prepared to talk about the one uh, that I can. Have, do yes. we have time? Yes. Should we see if people have questions first? Yes, sure. That's okay, we're good. So, this is going to be really fun. So, all of a sudden, out of the blue, about 10 days ago, this like page and a half paper came across the wire from France. Uh -huh. Unintended uh, HIV transmission in an ATI trial. Well, so everybody was like, what happened here? So, first of all, there, there are a lot of confounding factors, and it's a little salacious in that the method of transmission was supposed to be conolingus. Now, the woman was HIV negative. The, they were hetero, uh, heterosexual uh, couple, and the, the, the infected partner was the man. So conolingus is pretty low risk, period, let alone going that way. So nobody can stop talking about that, all right? <laughs> Which is really, you know, who cares? She got it, 
what do we do to fix this now? How can we fix this in the future? But I mean, you can't help commenting on that. I have so many mom to say, I'll stop right there. So then they said, well, he was an AIDS activist, so essentially almost saying he should have known better, you know, like they used to say about people with, um, uh, oh, you, you're, you got a viral rebound because you didn't take your medicine, you know. So, in other words, and then how, how, what year he got involved with it, his partner, all of a sudden, everything but his shoe size, okay? <laughs> and we were like, what the fuck are you telling all these people all about this guy, you know, and his, his partner? So then he had uncontrolled diabetes. What is he doing in this trial to start with? Then they were both depressed, and we were all depressed after we read this. And, you know, I kind of thought, well, you can't keep everybody out of the trials that are depressed. I mean, well, what's the, you know, I said the whole, I have two thirds of the country's been depressed since 2016. <laughs> and then somebody was, well, we really have this include depression. And so, and then Richard uh, Solomon said, well, maybe you should ask them to do, you, you, uh, use uh, validated scales of depression and decide whether people are in or out of trials. I mean, usually we try to advocate for people to get into trials. Anyway, so um, uh, uh, Giulio from Italy knew this guy, so we, the, the PI and the French investigator, so we asked him this list of questions that essentially addressed what I told you. Well, he was like, <laughs> he was like a lawyer, very evasive. Oh, well, I don't know this guy. He was from another site. And well, maybe I said too much, but I'm not really sure. And Richard thinks another's paper, another paper's come out. So we're going to write a response, but I think we're going to mention the things that I said, but we're going to concentrate because I really believe this is a golden opportunity, conolingus or otherwise, to show that this is, these are real people. This is a real risk, and people can become infected. And it's our job to do the best we can to make sure that people don't become infected. Of course, the elephant in the room is some people have more than one partner, so it gets a little complicated, as we all know. Any questions about that? So, I... <laughs> we got five minutes, you got plenty of time. Right. I'm gonna stand on this. <laughs> I, uh, I uh, actually was in the car with Doug Nixon when I uh, started to get the second round of, uh, second wave of responses um, from this article. My in initial response was certainly the, the cunnilingus part, which made me kind of go, okay. Um, Beck Young wrote a paper at one point that talked about, you know, the likelihood of cunnilingus transmission, but I won't go into that. Then I looked at the depression scale, and I won't go into that. And then I won't go into the, the leveraging his activism and what importance that played, so I won't go into that. But what I think that the challenge for me in it all was, was the, what I felt like was the immediate frenzy kind of that we did in, in our response mm -hmm. to it, and how I think that we collectively should uh, certainly develop a, a response. But I think that the diabetes and the depression scales are important. I think that there is something there. I think that when we look at who is and how trial inclusion criteria, inclusion and exclusion criteria <coughs> are done, we don't look frequently at things like depression scales, diabetes scales, but that there is some sort of malfeasance that was done when an author has now published that paper and that paper has now gone around the globe and there is some leverage that has been given to this individual's activism as his clout as like he should have known better. This is now going to be known as the he should have known better mm -hmm. paper. <laughs> right? And I'm like this, I mean, so we, we sit in this room and we kind of circulated it as the well, that's not right. He shouldn't have not necessarily known better. And we all kind of have now siphoned through this, and some academics have siphoned through this as, no, that's not right. But that's us in this group. There are a bunch of people who now have now taken this as Bible and verse. So I think that we can't just say, no, we're going to go this way. We have to address the, no, he shouldn't have known better. We have, I, I think we can't just ignore it. 
I just want to intervene for a second because Libya, we're very fortunate to have Libya here from the ANRS. And I, I, I am from the ANRS, but <laughs> so, oh my sorry, God. I am, uh, <laughs> you still got time to run. It's <laughs> <laughs> not our name. I'm from the Basic Research Branch, and I'm not, but I remember when this first came up. Uh, even if, if, we, if this was a therapeutic uh, vaccine trial from the Vaccine Research Institute, which is sponsored by NRS, which is where I work, okay? <laughs> so uh, I was, uh, uh, I remember the first thing is, why didn't you put people in PrEP, uh, the, the partners in PrEP? So uh, the answer of the investigator was PrEP was not yet available at the time, and they were- and I checked and it really wasn't at that time in France. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't, but, but anyway. But, uh, and then uh, the activist part, I'm sorry, I'm learning it here. I should have read the paper, but I could not, cannot understand that they would blame the guy for being an activist. Or, or or the opposite way, like it's, he, he was a, an, an activist. Uh, is this the French investing my colleagues, the ones that blamed? The yeah, and, and, <laughs> and at the end, also said, also said that well, there are some dangers, some side effect dangers of using PrEP, risks from using PrEP. And I thought, okay, now let's really slap us in the face. So, Karine, you had been a for a while. Things lost in translation from, from uh, yeah. 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 could be. So I think we have a unique opportunity as a field also now. Um, it's like, what can we learn from this case? There was another paper of Palich et al. that was the biomedical piece of it that, sh that said that bowel rebound is very quick in semen and blood um, and very unpredictable. So I think we, have, we can learn something from this. And this is also a case that tells us that we need to integrate the biomedical, the biosocial, psychosocial aspects of the ATI. We're dealing with the depression, um, and I think it's important to, to integrate behavioral and social science also to understand the behavioral part of it. And we have a unique opportunity to help strengthen reporting guidelines. How do we report these cases to ensure that they're non-stigmatizing in the future? Imagine if it had been a woman who had transmitted right. HIV or you know, anybody. We have to be- She'd have been the next Joan of Arc. I think, <laughs> okay, we need to like, um, maybe come to consensus as a community as to how we should report this and this, deal with this in the future. And there's the PrEP paper in press, so we will circulate it as soon as it's available. But we also need a lot more information about PrEP efficacy in the context of these ATIs. And this is where we will need research right. across studies. Yeah. And then and we're going to have to, you know, each place is going to have to come up with a solution for their whatever. Yeah. But Tony, all your points are well taken. We intend to address all of them. You know, we've been in touch with JRD, uh, uh, Korean emailed the editor. They're happy to hear our, get a response from us, so. But, and, and, but I think also the other piece of this is that to not make an assumption that the, the, the reporting was correct, right? We, we make an assumption that the individual reported his, his and her behavior to the, to the scientist that this is all we did. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, it, you know, we, we say that this is what they reported, that, that, that their only exposure was cunnilingus. I mean, maybe they reported that because that's the book that was going to keep them in the study, right? Yeah, we'll no. probably never get to talk to them. Exactly. And I, and I think that, that we have to, you know, acknowledge that sometimes people tell the scientists and tell the researcher what they want to hear to stay in the study. And, and this happens, and it happens often, and that's a part of the behavioral and social sciences element yeah. that we, we have to do, yeah. too. So I don't know kind of what the decision making is on who's a part of writing it. Well, I think what we're going to have to do, because we're going to have to do this quickly, is we're going to circulate it, and whoever wants to sign on can sign on. All right. Craig, can you make sure that you know, you know. Yes. Okay, how much time do we have, Michael? Um, we're over time. Let's take this one last question. What I think that you should contact, uh, you know, the TRT5, you know what TRT5. Yes. You should contact them because they might have been called into the, yeah. you know, the, 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 the independent, uh, you know if they were in the independent. Yeah, maybe uh, you could tell us how to do that, you know, uh, contact. Can, can, that would be helpful. I have the addresses. Can we probably take Laura's last question? Sure. Go ahead, Laurie. Oh, I, I, I was just going to say a couple of things. So one is, you know, I, you know, 
I, I think the whole he should have known better he was an activist is nonsense. Mm -hmm. And I also think that anybody who's knowledgeable would say, well, cunnilingus, who needs to worry about that? Right. Yeah. So as an educated person, that's not something that you would necessarily consider a very risky activity. Mm -hmm. And so that should also be put into context. Plus, it's a lot of personal and information that would make you, allow you to maybe figure out who this mm -hmm. person was. Right. The, the, well, yeah, there were, there, were, there were a thousand things yeah. wrong with the article. But um, the, you know, the other thing I think we really need to be careful of in our desire to protect partners is that we should not assume that most people in trials necessarily are in these you know, mutually monogamous relationships or have a steady partner. And I would not want to see us excluding people from participation because they happen to be people who choose to have multiple partners in their life that the steady investigators cannot be expected to protect. Right. So then, you know, what is it that we have, that we would want to ask of participants mm -hmm. while they are while they are on an ATI? Well, this is the last thing I'll say. But in the study, what they, what they, I mean, in the at the meeting, what they said was, was, if somebody comes back with a sexually transmitted disease during the ATI period, you'll know he's being active without, you know, taking precautions, he or she, and then they're out of the study. So. Say that again, Simon. An STI means you don't know whether their partners were on track. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, believe me, it's a million bugaboos. So I think I'm going to get the hook if we don't stop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so Everything we'll, else is happening this morning. I want to get the hook. Thank you. Did you have a break?